you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. What's up, Launch Streeters? Tamara here. Happy New Year. I uh, I know we are actually in the first full week, I guess really the second week of the new year. But here's the thing. I feel like this is the week where we really hit the ground running. It feels to me like that the first, the second, like the first days after New Year's Eve, I think you're just kind of like getting back into the swing of things. You are just getting your feet under you. You're unpacking from your kind of holiday break. This is the week that we really hit the ground running, which is why... I wanted to release this week, this particular interview, because I thought, what better way to start the new year? I mean, really hit the ground running, but then talking about the topic of grit. That's right, grit. Turns out that it's not skill, talent, resources that makes you successful. The difference between people that succeed, people that achieve their goals, and people that don't isn't those things. It's actually grit. How cool is that? Do you know what that means? That means we all have it. That means we can all tap into it regardless of our situations, regardless of our education, regardless of our intelligence. We can tap into grit. I don't want to go into detail because this interview has so much in it. But let me just say that Angela Duckworth, who is the author of Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance, dove deep in this interview with me about why grit helps us succeed when those other things don't and gives us some very cool examples, real world examples and proof that this is the case, including cadets at West Point. It's so cool. And I know that so many of you out there like me have big goals and visions and passions that you want to see happen this year in 2019. So let's start off with some grit and let's see what we can make happen. I know it's going to be a lot. Now, a little bit about our author, Angela Duckworth. As I said, she's the author of this incredible book that funny enough, I actually read before her people reached out to me. So the minute I saw that in my inbox, I was like, yes, please sign her up. Launch shooters need to hear this. Uh, She's a PhD. She is a 2013 MacArthur Fellow a professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, and the founder and scientific director of the Character Lab, a research and education nonprofit. She's also working to help the World Bank implement grit in countries around the globe, advising the White House Office of Behavior Change and assisting the Office of Economic Cooperation and Development in designing an online grit-related study. How incredible is this? And prior to all of this, she was an award-winning math and science teacher She completed her BA in neurobiology at Harvard and her MSc in neuroscience at Oxford and her PhD in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. Grit actually is her first book, but it is the culmination of all this work and research. And it is, it's not just inspiring. I think it will help you take action against all those incredible goals as we move into 2019. So what do you say? I stop talking and we get into the interview. Happy 2019, everyone. Let's make this the most innovative and game-changing year possible. Angela, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. So since we don't know each other yet, what's the one thing that me and, you know, the people in the community would be surprised to learn about you? I probably could have become a chef and not a psychologist. I love food. I worked at a restaurant once. I wrote a few articles that were like restaurant reviews. And um, it sometimes comes out in my work and the examples I use will be, you know, famous chefs or how restaurants work. How funny. Do you have a favorite dish or cuisine? I love this restaurant in Philadelphia called Vetri and the chef is awesome. His name is Mark Vetri and you know, it's the kind of food where like you can still recognize that it's food. It hasn't been like pulverized and like, you know, aerated. So um, I guess simple, 
you know, yeah, because it's Italian. It's so funny. I think sometimes with people's passions too, that it's actually great to keep it as a passion and not work because you can still explore it on the side and have all that love for it without having to do it every day. You know what I mean? It must be like having grandchildren, you know, all the fun parts, but you don't have to actually like put them to bed and, you know, take their desserts away. So totally. yeah, I think that having a passion about a hobby can be a great That's thing. really funny. I love how you said that. So, so let's dig into kind of your area why we're on this interview together. So you wrote this incredible book, Grit, and I want to dig into grit and what that really means and what it is. So let's start for the audience by just explaining to us what it is and why does grit matter? Grit in my research ends up being a common denominator of high achievers in in every domain that I've studied, you know, whether this is military leadership or entrepreneurs or, um, you know, people who strive to be excellent in arts and music. Grit is the combination of being really passionate about what you're doing, as well as persevering. So this combination of loving what you do and working really hard at it over extended periods of time, and really in the extreme cases, it can be working for a lifetime on the same thing. That's what grit is. Now, is grit something then that I have naturally? Can I learn it? How do we, how do we get it? If that's the right way to say it. I think every kid is born with DNA, the genes they inherited from their mom and dad that do incline them, you know, maybe to be a little harder working, maybe to be a little lazier. So I want to acknowledge right up front that there is a piece of the puzzle that you can't do very much about. What I am most interested in are all the pieces of the puzzle that you can do something about, you know, what you think about at night, the habits you develop, your attitudes, your experiences with mentors. And I do think that you can learn to be grittier. In particular, I think it all begins with understanding what you're interested in. And the rest of grit usually grows from that intrinsic curiosity. Oh, interesting. So you think it's kind of a combination of knowing what you're passionate about, maybe pursuing that, and then the grit is easier, I guess, or comes well, forward. The hard work comes easier when you actually care about what you're doing. I mean, we've all had the experience, I think, if we think back early enough to our childhood days, but, you know, just things that were really chores. You know, yeah. for me, it was piano practice. I hated <laughs> piano. I'm really like not even musical. I never listened to music. I, 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 I don't, I don't know why, but I just don't love music. I mean, other people are the opposite, by the way. So I'm not saying anything bad about music. Yeah. When I had to practice piano for the half hour day that my parents said I had to practice, I mean, I got nothing out of it. I think I tortured my piano teacher. For me, the hard work was especially hard because I didn't love what I was doing. In contrast, when kids can develop something that is intrinsically interesting to them, you know, I'm not saying they're going to run to the piano bench every day. I'm not saying they're going to always love to do the kind of disciplined practice that makes you great. But it's a world of difference in doing something hard that you love and doing something hard that you don't care about. You know, it's so interesting. I I have a friend who doesn't love what they do for work and they, you know, kind of chug through it. But if you see them in their passion in building furniture, they could focus for hours on end. But if you asked him at work what he's like, I think people would actually say that he lacks attention span, focus, vision. But if you see him in this other part of his life, it's like he's the complete opposite. The thing is that you can have the utmost grit and still qualify for a diagnosis of ADHD. ADHD is often, you know, this kid's not paying attention to what they're supposed to be paying attention to, like math class. They're not sitting still when they're supposed to. But really, when you're in love with what you do, you don't need to use that kind of self-control. You want to spend hours and hours. I mean, some people, when they're really in flow, doing what they love, really concentrating, they can spend hours and even forget to eat or drink. It's that kind of absorption that's voluntary and not external. I think that gives a lot of us hope because we might say like, oh, wait, I don't have a great attention span. But, you know, ask yourself, what's your attention span for the things that you love? Right. It's a completely different answer. I want to dig into some of the stories in your book because I, I think you did a brilliant job of bringing to life actually kind of, I thought, surprising examples of where grit really rose to the top as the as the reason why people kind of succeeded or, or didn't. Will you share with us kind of some of your favorite stories or maybe the one that surprised you the most? One of the people that I met during the course of researching the book was Steve Young, 
who, if you're of a certain generation, will remember is a NFL oh, I know. quarterback. Right? Okay. Uh, I'm also from the Bay Area, so I definitely know who yeah, he is. Yeah, you where you live, <laughs> how you like football. Yeah. Anyway, Steve Young is, you know, a hero um, to many. And his dad, no joke, was literally nicknamed Grit. Oh. Um, I mean, I can't even make it up. And, and the nickname was very intentional because his dad um, – Grit. I mean, he does have a given name, but he refuses to go by it. His dad, Grit Young, um, you know, took that name because it was defining for his identity. It was who he is. And he raised this son, Steve, who obviously had athletic talent. It's not that he was, you know, a super scrawny little kid. But really what he taught Steve was, you know, the power of working at something, working at really hard. One of the stories that I learned from Steve is that when he was trying to become a better quarterback, it was clear that he has, you know, pretty good running game, but his his passing was subpar. And this young man threw 10,000 spirals, 10,000 practice passes all by himself on a field into a big net at the end. And you'd have to like go back periodically and you know, right. like get all the balls. Uh, and, and he did that to get better and better. And I think that's the kind of perseverance and passion that – I think are magical. And then when you see him, you know, in the Super Bowl doing magical things, you know, you know, if you know the whole story, that it's not just natural born talent, that there's enormous effort that's hidden from view. You know, I want to get to another story too, but before I do that, you um, hit on something that you talk about in your book that I, I think is important for us to talk about. And that is, um, you know, yes, we see the tip of the iceberg, right? We see Steve Young in the Super Bowl and, you know, on the field and that's all great. We don't see everything else. Yet we put all this um, emphasis and accolades and, you know, admiration on what we think is natural talent. So if we know, I I think instinctively that grit is what gets us to success or to those places, why do we spend so much time going, oh, my God, that guy's just so naturally gifted? You know, there are two reasons. I, by, by the way, um, it's so ironic to me that sometimes after I've, you know, given a talk for book tour or, yeah. or you know, written something, people will literally say to me like, oh, I, I think you're so naturally talented. Yeah. Um, and I think to myself, oh, my gosh, like almost all of my research is about you know, these other factors. So um, maybe I'm not that good because I haven't been communicating very effectively. <laughs> let me get to that right? point again. <laughs> yeah, let me get to that. Okay, so there's two reasons. One is like it is dazzling to watch somebody, you know, who dances, then you can't dance half as good or even a fourth as good, you know, people who can play music really well, people who can lead really well or communicate, you know, public speaking otherwise. So I think one reason why we gravitate to this kind of magical explanation of natural talent is that it is truly awesome to watch human beings do things that are, you know, really, really fluid for them. But the second reason I think is a motivational um, kind of almost defense mechanism. And it was Friedrich Nietzsche, the great German philosopher who said, you know, when we see genius, we say it must be natural, it must be a gift, but we don't want to see the hours and the rough copies Mm. and the drafts. And he said, why is that? And I think the defensive mechanism is, well, if it really is something that you could do, if you were willing to work hard enough at it, then you'd be obligated to do it. And I think for many of us, it's just more comfortable to say Mm. like, well, we'll never be Steve Young. I'll never sing like Adele. So like, you know, I'm not going to try. That's, you know, I, I think for launch readers out there listening to what Angela's saying is so important because it really translates to our community of innovators who are trying to get out there and kind of, you know, do something a little bit more game changing. I think sometimes we look at people like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, a- any of those, and we go, oh, they're just so, they just think differently so naturally. And I think it's funny because, you know, I've been in innovation for 25 years now and I'm better and better at it, but I think it's because I have 25 years of doing it every single day, not because I actually am that much more innovative than anybody else. And it's a great reminder to all of us that we that we have to take ownership of it and we have to work at it versus looking at those people and going, oh, they're just they're just so different. And does Steve Jobs look different? Maybe, but he also was thinking differently since he was ten years old. So And Steve Jobs has has talked about it, right? I mean yeah. he's written about it. He's given commencement speeches about how, you know, it wasn't that he knew everything that he knew at the very beginning, but it really was a journey. And, you know, if you look back at other innovators from past times, you know, Thomas Edison is a popular one. The expression attributed to him is 99% is, you know, of being creative is yeah. perspiration, you know, only 1% is inspiration. But if you look at his biography, and actually, he's written really um, eloquently about what it was like to become an inventor, and the mythology of like, well, he wakes up and, you know, almost literally, yeah. there's a light bulb above his head. Right. Um, no, it really right. was 
you know, a process. You know, you go to bed one night, you're thinking about something, you're dreaming about it, you wake up the next day, you do that day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. That's, I think, where good ideas come from. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and it's funny, you were talking about getting off stage and people saying that to you. People will often say to me when I get off stage, you know, oh, you're just so natural on stage. And I think you have no idea the amount of hours I put in front of the mirror and talking to my dog to try to get better. And same with innovation of, oh, you just think differently. I'm like, no. I mean, yes, but it's because I've worked at it for so long to get there. I, you know, if, if we could say this, you know, especially to the young people who are listening, who might still have this, you know, somewhat like naive belief that like the people that you see who are so far ahead of you, like they had something that you don't have. You know, I was once in this position that maybe very similar to what you were describing, I was sitting at a big dinner, the speaker before me just was so great. And even before I could catch myself, I said, oh my gosh, you're such a natural. I mean, coming yeah. out of the mouth of me. <laughs> and I kind of caught myself and I said, oh gosh, you know, and, and as I was thinking like, well, that was a stupid thing. Thing for me to say. She said, you know what? I'm terribly shy. I mean, you won't meet a shyer, but I hate public speaking. I'm a distance runner and I practice that speech. Over, I mean, I could give the speech backwards by the time I get up there. And that is how fluent it is. And that is what excellence is. Excellence is not a gift. It's earned. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Will you share a little bit about your the, the story that you open up with in the book? And by the way, for everyone listening, go get it because there are so many great stories and things that are applicable to your daily life. But the, the first story you open up with about West Point blew my mind because I know a couple of people who went and I just, when I think of what it takes to even get into West Point, let alone make it through that beginning stage, it, it was shocking to me actually that grit was it because I assumed I don't know. I'm not sure what I assumed, actually. I guess I assumed the incorrect thing that, well, they've got grades and recommendations and blah, blah, blah. The remarkable thing about West Point is you're right. It isn't incredibly hard to get in. I mean, it takes, you know, a couple of years to really complete the entire admissions process. I mean, you know, you have to get a congressional recommendation. You have to take a, you know, a, a test that is trying to assume, you know, that you can measure your physical talent. Your SAT scores have to be top notch. You typically are, you know, a valedictorian or very close to it. Um, you're almost always a varsity athlete um, and very often, you know, a varsity athlete captain, if not a captain of three varsity sports. I mean, these are extraordinary. I mean, I can't even, <laughs> you know, it's hard to even fathom that there's then something else that separates in that group, you know? I mean, you would think they'd all get through, right? right? I mean, yeah. after that kind of process. And, and that is exactly why the generals at West Point allowed me to do the study in the first place, because they really believe that if you have made it through that process, that you really can get through and you can make a contribution to the army and to your country. So they're mystified as well when, when young women and men drop out in those first two months after taking, you know, two years of their life trying to get into the place. I think the real challenge of West Point isn't the push-ups and the sit-ups and the waking up at five in the morning and the like, you can't have a cell phone. I don't think that's the real challenge. The challenge, I think, is not being a superstar for the first time in your life. And many of the listeners, I think, are going to recognize this. In the first time in your life where you're not the special one, that you're not the one that everyone is looking to as, you know, the shining example, maybe for the first time in your life you're below average at something. You know, how do you psychologically handle that? Do you quit on a bad day or do you not quit on a bad day? And I think a lot of grit is not quitting on a bad day. Yeah, it, that is really hard, isn't it? And, and do you think somewhere in there is having the end in mind – um, you know, not getting wrapped up in the moment. You know, there's this um, kind of a, a, a tension or a balance. I think great performers do have the end in mind. I mean, they know the big picture. They know what this is all for. And that, by the way, gives human beings meaning and purpose. You know, something that, for example, I'm sure many listeners have, um, you know, read or listened to A Man's Search for Meaning by yeah. Viktor Frankl. I'm I, actually reading it right now. It's so uh, incredible. And then when you get to the end, you should just start over. Right. right totally. It's, it's, you know, it's yeah. that good. And what gives a human being meaning is to understand the big picture that, you know, it's not just that you're, you know, filling out this form or writing back this email, but you do see that, like, it serves a higher purpose and, and a purpose that's meaningful to you in a, in a moral and personally identifiable, like, this is who I am kind of way. At the same time, and here's the balance. You know, you do have to pay attention to the details and you do have to like answer the email carefully and spell check it and, and kind of keep your head down in a way. So I think of it in a way like kind of like open water swimming. You know, you're supposed to keep your head down and paddle and, you know, really try to focus on your stroke. But periodically you do need to look up and see whether you're you're swimming in the right direction. And I think having both the end in mind as well as a very healthy attention to what's happening today is really the combination that you want to be successful. So how do you measure 
grit in yourself? Will you break it down for us so the listeners out there can really think about, am I really applying the grit? Do I need to get a little bit more? Yeah, what? Yeah, I think that's the question. Right? Yeah. Like where, where can I improve personally? And, and am I good or am I, I don't know how to compare myself, I guess. So I think I have a ton of grit, but do I? I don't know. Well, you can take my grit scale as a, as a tool for self-reflection. I didn't develop it for that. I developed it for research studies like the one I did at West Point. But the questions that are on the grit scale, you know, I finish whatever I begin. I am a hard worker. Setbacks don't discourage me. These are questions where when you read them and you say, you know, how would I rate myself? You know, very much like me, sort of like me. You know, they're, they're a way of kind of looking in the mirror and assessing your grit and also maybe more helpfully where your grit may be flagging. So in addition to the questions that I just mentioned, there are also questions about having an interest or a project that is consistent from year to year to year, not giving up on projects or ideas that take a really long time to come to fruition. Those are passion questions. For many people who take the grit scale, they find out that there are pretty hard workers, but maybe they're lacking in passion. For others, they might find that they've got a lot of enthusiasm, but they're not getting anything done. They're not working on their weaknesses. They're not resilient. So I do think that taking questionnaires, and that includes the grit questionnaire, can be helpful so that you can then say, oh, now that I know a little bit more about where I need to you know, pay attention or work, I think I know the next step that I can take. You know, kind of to what you said a minute ago about, you know, being able to stick it out when it's a long time to come to fruition. I think for innovators in particular, that's incredibly important because we get shot down a lot when you're trying to do something different, particularly if you work in a large organization where you've got systems and legacy thinkers and, you know, it's a big ship to try to move, even if it's just a little thing you want to do. You really do have to have that ability to kind of continue with it even through the long haul of it. Because I think oftentimes with innovation, we think, oh, so-and-so had a brilliant idea and bam, it all went up, everything happened, life was great, game was changed. Right, you only see the highlight reel. Yeah, totally. You you don't get all the, you don't usually get the director's cut of, you know, what really happened. Well, many of your listeners, I'm sure, idealize Jeff Bezos. Yeah. And, you know, he's kind of like what they would hope for, or even half of what he's accomplished. Um, I mean, even an eighth of it. (laughs) Maybe an eighth, maybe a hundred, right? (laughs) So amazing. So, so, uh, so what can we learn from Jeff Bezos? Well, I read his annual letter every year, as I'm sure you do, and many other because it is, you know, just a necklace of pearls of wisdom. I also read it because um, his mom is on the board of my nonprofit, so we get to talk a lot about, oh, great. you know, how he was raised. Now, what you would learn from the last letter was um, a story about head, handstands, and he, he uses it as a metaphor, but it's a true story, and it's about a friend who's trying to learn how to do a handstand, and, you know, they, they start trying, you know, they kick up their feet, and, like, it's really hard, and what they learn is that, first of all, it helps to have a coach. Second of all, it takes a lot of trials. Third of all, those trials don't last for, you know, just days. You know, it doesn't take a day or a week to learn how to do a handstand. It takes weeks and weeks, you know, and and the feedback's important. I think all the things that you were describing as the challenges of being an innovator, especially in a bigger, you know, context of a corporation, you know, they all apply. And it's like learning how to do a handstand. It's really tough. It helps to have an ally or a coach. It's going to take a lot of repetitions. And the success is not going to come overnight. This may, I'm going to fumble this question because it's kind of, I'm thinking about it as I'm (laughs) saying it out loud. Um, If if you're a a leader of a team of some kind, whether that's a sports team, a a corporate team, a new business team, whatever it is, um, how do you apply, how do you apply grit to your team to kind of improve everybody's performance? I have been asked that question a lot. And, you know, I want to be humble here because I'm not a, you know, seasoned CEO. I have a tiny little nonprofit and the team is not much more than a dozen people. So, you know, what do I know about these sizable organizations? Well, I was asked the question so much that I decided to write an article for Harvard Business Review. It's in the current issue of the magazine on organizational grit. And the recommendation, this partly comes from talking to truly great leaders like Toby Cosgrove, who just retired as a CEO of the Cleveland Clinic. What what do gritty people like him say about building a gritty organization? One thing that's very important is that you are a role model. And in some ways, it's like the Ralph Waldo Emerson quote that an organization is the extended shadow of its leader. If you are nice and you model niceness and generosity, you will develop a corporate culture 
of kindness and generosity. If you are mean-spirited and critical, you will develop a culture of mean-spirited, critical people. I think the most important thing is that you model. And the only other lesson I just want to share is that I do think that just as an individual has a very clear, you know, you said, you know, having the end in mind or like the long game, a hierarchy of goals. I know what my purpose is, but I also know how tactically I'm going to get there. That's true for the individual. It's especially important for an organization. The mission statement is at the top. That's what we're here for. That's the vision. And then we've got a strategy. And then under that, we've got some like first quarter goals that we're trying to achieve because the first quarter of our fiscal year, a hierarchy of goals for an organization can be just as clarifying as a hierarchy of goals can be for an individual. So I was taking a note here. Um, I, t- I take notes old, old school still. I, I write. So sometimes you, it takes me a while to catch up. Do you know up. <laughs> that, that um, science shows that, that hand, handwritten notes are more effective than taking notes on a laptop? So. He's yeah, well, it. thank you. Well, I just find that, you know, it's funny. If I don't write it, I don't internalize it. If I type it, I just, it just. That is exactly what the research says. Uh, when you're uh, typing, you just become like a stenographer. It's just like, you know, it's just, you know, all you're doing yeah. is typing. But when you're much. writing, you know, you're thinking. Yeah, exactly. So it's hard yeah. to think, talk, and write at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, so, it is. Um, I want to loop back, though, to what you're saying about modeling and about grit inside a culture, because I think right now in particular, with the rate of change, it's so rapid, and we have mm-hmm. to have grit to get through. I think what, you know, given the way you define it, given what's going on in our marketplaces, you know, I work with a lot of companies, large and, and midsize, and one of the challenges that they face is how do we get our people to really stick it out given I'm constantly asking them to adapt, to change, to come up with innovation, to because that's what the marketplace demands. Um, and to I, kind of to your point about organizational grid, I think now more than ever, it's so important. I completely agree. I mean, it's it's true of every sector. People used to say that about technology, but like you can then you say about healthcare, you say about like yeah. media. I mean, everything is changing and it's changing at like a kind of an astounding clip. I think people can feel whiplash, you know, and you like walk into your company one day and it's like all of a sudden your, you know, your whole strategy seems to have changed overnight. Yeah. The thing that I think can both encourage the kind of adaptability, the flexibility that you do need to have in this rapidly changing era that we're living in. But also the steadiness, right? I mean, there has to be a keel, the ship, right? Um, the, the, the combination can be achieved when you really have that clear hierarchy of goals that I mentioned. When your company or your organization really knows what it's trying to accomplish, I'll use mine as just an example. Our mission is to help children thrive through psychological science. Everything that we do is about helping children thrive through psychological science. Maybe that means making digital resources for teacher that are accessible through the internet. Maybe one day it'll mean making those mobile friendly because teachers are using their cell phones for instruction in class. Maybe one day it'll mean something else. Those are lower level goals. Those are all just a means to an end of helping kids thrive using psychological science. Your company needs a mission statement that's not gonna change because it's this abstract goal The tactics are where you're flexible. The tactics where you say, look, there's a new technology. It wasn't here before. We have a new competitor. They weren't here before. The tactics you could be flexible about. The top level mission oriented goal you should be very stubborn about. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think to your, I love how you said that, to be stubborn about it. Actually, that is great. It really is the rock for everything else. And I find with um, organizations that we work with, if they are not clear about that rock, about where they're headed and what they're really about, why why they're doing what they're doing, then they tend to get wrapped up in uh, latest and greatest versus really thinking about, is this the right innovation or change for us? Versus, you know, oh my gosh, yeah, that's what everybody's doing. We got to get on board with that. And that tends to fail because it actually isn't connected to why they're doing what they're doing. Exactly right. And clarity is key, right? And this clarity, and and, and like you, I mean, I'm not only a handwritten note taker, I'm also like somebody who really likes to draw things in my notebook. Me too. You, know, you have them like written down, it's like, this is our goal, and you draw lines, and like under that, you know, in the article that I mentioned, there's the hierarchy of goals for, you know, for a healthcare organization, but you can, you know, use that just as an example. I think it's really, really helpful. And frankly, I think it's helpful to put it up on the wall so that everybody else can see and, you know, maybe do it on post-its because, you know, things change but you can tell that the things at the top, maybe you write that in magic marker, right? Because like, we're not changing our mission statement, people. Um, But these other things are going to put on post-its because our tactics and our quarterly goals might change. It's so, it's really fascinating to me how big of a difference grit make. And I'm just, I'm curious going back, if you can remember this time when you started all this, were you, were you surprised by how much of a factor grit 
really is? Were you kind of, what was your mindset going into this? You know, the funny thing is, and my husband would tell you this, um, and maybe when you started the show and you were like, hey, what's one thing that's surprising? Yeah. I could have I also said this. You know, I think I'm a little girl who grew up into a woman who studies effort. But, you know, my whole childhood, I, I, I thought a lot about talent and, and being smart because my dad always – talked about himself, frankly, as being smart and, you know, maybe a little less smart than my uncle Tom, but like, you know, maybe smarter than my other uncle who I won't name. Um, yeah. and, and this like obsession with talent. And also I had a little bit of a fixed mindset. I was like, well, some people are born like uncle Tom and they're just smarter than people like my dad. And then there's these other people and they're like a little less smart. I really did grow up with something of a fixed mindset and an obsession with this idea of talent that couldn't be changed. And I do think that as I grew up, I realized through my own research, and I think you, like just to your question, right, it did in part surprise me when you really get rigorous about it and you really start asking the question, you know, how did Steve Jobs become Steve Jobs? You know, you know, how did, um, you know, people who achieved great things achieve those things? It is so much more about the hidden story of, t of, of effort and practice and feedback and coaching and mentoring and frankly listening to shows like this and getting a little smarter about things. So I've kind of convinced myself in part through the research that the story of success is not the one that I thought it was when I was a little girl. Well, and I do wonder to what you were saying in the beginning, if, if some of the reason we like to say, oh my God, they're just so naturally gifted, aside from it being fun to, to watch and think that's true, is it really does deflect us having to put ourselves out there and go, are, are we really putting the effort and the drive into this or are we just kind of coasting? I, I really do agree. And I want to be compassionate towards ourselves. I mean, if it's yeah. just a natural impulse to be like, oh, I guess I can't run as fast as Usain Bolt. Like maybe I won't go for a run today. Um, but I do think once you begin to um, try this life, you know, just as experiment, you know, what would it be like to you know, live your life like a gritty person who, you know, doesn't take no easily, who is always asking, you know, what's one thing I can do better? You know, who, who shows up early, who stays late, who's listening voluntarily to podcasts like this, not because they have to, because they want to try it out. See, see how it feels. You might find that you like that life a lot and that it's more gratifying than how you're doing things today. Oh my gosh. I love this idea, Launch Streeters, of a gritty challenge. So we all should do one thing that would make us a little grittier to what Angela said. Come in a little bit early, put a little extra effort in, give it a little more. Oomph. I love that. We're going to do that challenge. Um, I would love to know what happens. You have oh, to get back to me. I will. That'd be so great. I, I want to go back to what you said earlier about kind of grit and the effort. You know, I, I read this article recently. Um, it was about kids, but I, I think it relates to adults. Kind of after I read it, I got a little bit reflective about how I run my business too, but it was talking about... Um, it was based on some research. You, you probably already know it, but it was kids who are rewarded for the effort they put into their grades versus for the grades actually do better long term. So if I say to my, and I'm cognizant of this because I have two boys, nine and 13. So if I say to them, hey, Liam, great effort that you put studying, you know, to get prepared for the math test, it really paid off versus, hey, you're really smart, way to get an A. Um, that the kids who get that effort reward actually do better and see themselves as smarter, stronger, whatever, down the road. And I wonder for adults, too, if that really translates into, particularly, again, when, you know, just looping it back to innovation, if I say to my team, hey, great effort trying to get that off the ground. We don't even know where it's going to go yet, but I love what you put into it. If that's really all about really fostering grit versus fostering the outcome. What you're talking about is very famous research now done um, in part by Carol Dweck, who came up with the whole idea of growth mindset, which I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with. And in this research study, exactly right. Little kids are either praised for their effort or more for their outcomes. And when you praise for the hard work and the effort, you do get this kind of you know more resilient motivation effectively um, over time because that's what you're praising. Right. So so if you go to your team and you say that, that's why you have to be really careful, though, by the way. Right. I think if you want to praise the outcome, then they might think like, oh, let's just keep showing the boss the outcome. And then they might get worried when the outcome's not happening. You know, hopefully you know, they won't do this, but maybe it could even encourage some kind of like cheating or inflation. What you praise is what you'll get. I think you have to be careful, though, too, not to praise like, hey, I really like that you were there on a Saturday night at two in the right? morning. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Way know, to not have a life. <laughs> we'll get that, too. Right. And then that's going to lead to burnout. So here's the recommendation. It's called process praise. And again, a lot of this pioneering work was done by Carol Dweck. 
when you praise the process, you bring attention to the process itself. So you say like, you know what I really liked about that report? First of all, it was very succinct. You didn't go on forever. Second of all, I loved the graphics. The graphics were really clear. Third of all, I love the paper it was printed on. That was like three very specific things. It was about the process. It wasn't just like, hey, that was a great report or, you know, the outcome client was really happy. Be specific because then, first of all, that's more information. The person's like, great, okay, I learned something. And second of all, like, you will get what you praise for. So, you know, now you're going to get somebody who's paying attention to the visuals, to the succinctness, to the quality of the paper. You know, so praise what you want and that's what you'll get. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I always talk about um, rewarding behaviors, not outcomes at work Mm -hmm. uh, with innovation because I think, you know, outcomes is like, it's like Russian roulette. It's 50-50. It either worked or it didn't. And half the time it doesn't work, not because of you, but because some change in the marketplace or the environment, like, you know, I mean, we can put our best effort into it and it still doesn't work. Not, you know, Steve Young didn't connect every single pass, although he was good. (laughs) Yeah, and, and you're exactly right. And, you know, the best coaches, and I am um, privileged to work with some of them, the best coaches are very careful about the way they praise their players. So, you know, for example, Brad Stevens on the Boston Celtics, you know, he's not saying like, oh, great job, you know, you scored two points. He's praising what specifically the player may have done. Now, maybe the player took a risk, like you're saying, right? Like maybe they took a shot where, you know, calculated risk, wasn't certain to get in, Maybe he praises that player and they take the shot and it doesn't even get in because what he's praising is that, you know, calculation and the courage to take a risk. If you want your team to be risk taking, of course, with thought behind it, every time you see them do that, regardless of the outcome, go out of your way to praise it. Yeah, I think for launch shooters out there listening, that is so important. Um, what Angela is saying, because if you don't praise that risk, they're not going to take it. And it's too scary to wait until it's a success or failure. That's I always call it. It's either the failure shelf or cake on Friday. And there's no in between. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, there are some companies, I think Microsoft is one of them that actually goes out of their way to praise things very, very kind of postmortem. Right. So, you know, when Satya Nadella takes like a big risk and it doesn't pay off, he's very, very attentive to going around to the team and saying, like, I want to praise you for taking this risk with me. You know, the end of the story is always the moral of the story. Right. And if you have the right people and the right tools, they're taking thoughtful, smart risks. It just doesn't right. always work. <laughs> That's right. all. It's not reckless risks, exactly right. as you say. Yeah. Right, right. So before I ask the final question, where can people go to learn more, connect with you? I know we obviously we'll put the link to uh, um, Amazon to get the book. My favorite website for, for accessing my work, especially if you're a parent or a teacher, is characterlab.org. And it's a nonprofit website. It's completely philanthropically supported. So every resource on there for grit and other aspects of character are completely free. So I'd encourage readers to go there. Do you think um, grit is um, contagious? You know, I think there is a, a social contagion to just about everything. You know what it's like to walk into a uh, you know, room and kind of everybody's in a bad mood. Pretty yeah. soon you're in a bad mood, but, you know, the opposite is also true. Everyone's in a good mood. You start laughing, too. I think with grit, it can be inspiring to be with people who really love what they do and, and who are working hard if you feel like you could be one of them. Mm. I think the difference is that you don't want to create a culture where, like, the newcomer, who's maybe not yet there in terms of the grit level that you already have for the veteran feels that kind of, you know, intimidation or isolation, like, oh, I guess I don't belong here. So you want to tell them that this is where you will be, right? Yeah. So that's, you know, a way of making social contagion work for you in, in, in and the, you know, the kind of the virtuous cycle play out the way it, it often does. Yeah, I was just thinking about teams that I've been on, I think both as a student in school and also in work and, and in sports, where you had one or two people on the team who just went after it and it was just hard not to elevate your game to to meet Mm -hmm. theirs or at least try. If you're like you, which is to say that you probably had some level of confidence that like you're like uninspired, I could do that because there are people who are not like you right now and they would be discouraged by that. They would say like, oh my gosh, that person's so much better than me. You know, I'm going to try less hard. So I think it all turns on that kind of initial mindset. You know, if you think that you could become like people that you admire, then you'll start to work toward that. And then soon enough, you know, you'll probably be the person other people are looking at and saying like, gee, I wonder if I could be like her. That is a great point though. It's kind of that, what's that old phrase? You can't change people who don't want to be changed. 
I, I do think that a lot of it does come from some um, kind of internal insight or motivation. But for those of you who aren't quite there yet, I just want to say that, you know, that that also can change, right? There might be a time in your life where you're just really depressed and despondent, but that doesn't mean that even that will last forever. I think the power of people to improve their lives and to learn, to really learn, I think is, is always surprising to me. I mean, human beings learn better than any animal on the planet. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, I this is why I do what I do in innovation. Our, our goal here is to unlock the innovator in everybody because I believe that everybody has it just in varying degrees in different ways. So, but to your point, it doesn't mean that we have to be like that all the time on our A game and in the flow. And I think that's unrealistic to think that we don't have good days and bad days or even good years mm-hmm. and bad years, frankly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I really think of life as a marathon and not a sprint. And, you know, we're not always at our best. And, and, and not to think of it as this kind of like everything turns on, you know, today being a great day. I think that kind of compassion that we might have for ourselves actually in the long run. You know, one of my um, uh, my most admired gritty leaders is Jeff Canada, who started the Harlem Children's Zone. He was like, you know, you got to think about yourself as an athlete. And, you know, sometimes you sprain your ankle and you got to like nurse it and you, you got to get to bed. And, you know, you got to get enough sleep. You got to, you know, eat well but it is a stamina thing this thing called life and i think it allows us to you know understand that you know not every race is going to be a great race not every day is going to be a great day yeah it's funny that you say that because you know as i'm a highly driven person and which can be (laughs) good and bad um the but i find that i sometimes when i have a day where i'm tired i'm just not feeling it i just need a break i actually get this weird guilt happening of like i'm not being gritty enough today shame on me um, and yeah, I, you, and I'm sure you're working on it though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I aware. am. I'm, I'm, yeah. I have finally come to the realization that, hey, you also need to rejuvenate and downtime and give yourself a break and pace yourself a little bit. And that's okay to have those days, but I used to really fight it and try to fight through it, like really white knuckle it. Um, mm-hmm. And it doesn't work. You know, that maybe that's one of the, you know, the, the things that to balance when you really have a great work ethic, you know, your whole life, you've probably like instinctively gone and done the hard thing, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. like, like being tired was just I a like the hard thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. But, but I do think it means like, oh, wait, I'm actually enjoying what I'm doing. Is that okay? You know, for me, when I'm reading scientific articles, I actually literally said out loud the other day, I'm like, is this all right that I'm like sitting in this, right. you know, like, I love this. This is so great. So yes, you know, take care of yourself. I mean, however that is, yoga, great coffee in the morning, sleep, but also, you know, recognize that if you already have a really great work ethic, then you're going to have to make sure that you allow yourself to just enjoy and really, you know, like, you know what it feels like when you're on a bicycle and you're going on that downhill part? Like there are times when champions are, you know, going downhill fast without pedaling and, you know, enjoy it. And if you're not doing that at all, you probably mean that you're not doing the right thing. So that that's a good thing that you're enjoying those stretches of ease. Yeah, and I, you know, no, no longer feel guilty for doing my reading at two o'clock in the afternoon because at the end of the day, that's part of what makes me better. So mm-hmm. I used to fight that to be like, no, I can't do it till after work hours. Um, so Angela, this has been amazing. The book for launch readers out there, and again, I'll put the l- link is Grit: The Power of Passion and Perseverance. As, as I was telling Angela before we started recording, I was so excited when her marketing team reached out to her PR, who the, the magical people that do those things that connect us, um, because I already actually, actually had already read it and absolutely loved it and got a ton out of it. So this was a real treat for me, Angela. Your one last piece of advice uh, for launch readers <laughs> out there looking to you know up their grit factor. You know, sometimes I think of motivation like a half-filled helium balloon. You know, you do have to keep batting that thing back up in the air. So, so you know, if you need to keep listening to things, read new books, you know, find inspiration from other stories, and you're just like me. You know, you really need to always be working on your motivation. It's not something that you kind of fix and then, you know, it's like no. it's done forever. It's a little bit like fitness that way, isn't it? You can't just go yeah. to the gym once and be like, six-pack abs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got to do it every day. (laughs) Exactly. Well, Angela, thank you so much. This has been incredibly insightful, and I'm looking forward to uh, releasing it out to our community. Thank you. I so enjoyed it. Hey, Launch Treaters. Wasn't that incredible? Isn't it exciting to know that there's something inside of you that you can tap into to get to that next level? I thought it was pretty cool. And, you know, to loop it back to innovation, Grit is so important when you're trying to do things in an innovative way, whether that's in your work and life, a product you're trying to put on the marketplace, a process you're trying to improve, whatever it is. We talk about this in the interview, so I hope this really, really sank in with you that we need grit to push through. We need that grit to 
to overcome the no's and the obstacles and navigate the kind of ebb and flow that is innovation and is the world that we live in. So if I were to ask you to do one thing, it would be to apply grit daily. I think it's possible. That's going to be one of my actually personal goals in 2019 is to wake up every day and at every turn, think about how I can add a little bit of grit. Sometimes, I don't know if you feel this way. I know I do. Sometimes I feel like I hit a brick wall and I just want to stop. I just am like, all right, this brick wall is too exhausting. I really don't, I really don't want to have to deal with it. But with a little bit of grit, I bet I could get over the wall. And I bet you can too. So that's the action I want you to take. Let's get, let's all do this together. Let's all get a little bit of grit in our lives. All right. Tamara out. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.